anatomy with cerebral palsy is going to be the brain. It's going to be hypoxic during childbirth, and that's the most common cause of this. And it's also known as prenatal cerebral hypoxia. So kind of breaking that down before you're born, you're losing oxygen to the brain. So that's a big thing that's going to be happening with this. It's going to demonstrate, it's going to show up as an upper motor neuron disorder because, you know, brain upper motor neuron kind of issue going on. It's going to show with increased spasticity, motor delays. So they're not hitting their developmental milestones. And then for the rest of the body somatically, they might end up with any sort of hip dislocations or even shoulder dislocations just due to the either flaccidity or the hypotonia or even some spasticity causing problems where the muscle ends up pulling the joint out of the socket. So those are some things that are affected atomically, but in anatomically, but the main thing we're thinking about is the brain here. So etiology, most common reason is that prenatal cerebral hypoxia, as I mentioned before, this happens for a variety of reasons. Most commonly it's because they're stuck in the birth canal and they've lost oxygen. So that asphyxia, asphyxia that I mentioned at the end there, but it can also be called by premature birth. So that's why it's really a scary thing. If the baby is being born too early prolapse cord, that just means that the cord is like clamped and there's no oxygen getting from the placenta to the baby placenta abruption, same kind of thing. The placenta is getting all messed up and whatnot, and there's no oxygen being delivered to the baby through the umbilical cord. So these are some of the main reasons why a baby would be losing oxygen at birth, resulting in um, cerebral palsy. And they, they've, um, I believe it might be in one of the textbooks that you guys have used in school, but it talks about how they could lose oxygen for only like 20 seconds and they cause a cerebral palsy. So making sure that the baby is getting oxygen to its brain at all times. And then there's also the risks of prenatal. There are also prenatal risks, which include maternal malnutrition, infection, or RH incompatibility. So going back to infections, like literally there's so many different infections that can cause so many pro problems and birth defects, anywhere from like microcephaly to like, um, well, cerebral palsy, as we're talking about. So making sure that the mother is being taken care of throughout her pregnancy and getting those prenatal checkups, uh, malnutrition, as I said before, uh, any sort of lack of nutrition for the mother is going to negatively affect the baby. So making sure that the mother is being taken care of, going to those prenatal appointments, as I said before, and then with RH incompatibility. So this is when the mother is RH negative and the baby is RH positive during her second pregnancy. So the first one, it's going to be okay. But when they have the second pregnancy, they have all these antibodies against the RH factor, and it's going to cause problems with uh, the incompatibility between the mother and the fetus. So making sure that the mother's, you know, essentially it all comes back to making sure you're going to our prenatal visits. Um, postnatal factors. So this is anything that happens after they're born could be a cerebral vascular accident or a stroke, any sort of trauma to the brain. So that's why, you know, shaking baby syndrome, any sort of dropping your child, don't do that. Any sort of infection immediately following birth. So this is why you're trying to make sure that those babies stay healthy. So then they don't have anything happening that's going to affect their brain. Or unfortunately, a brain tumor could be another one of the reasons why that this baby develops cerebral palsy. So what does it look like? So when you guys voted to do this one, I was like, oh my gosh, there's so much to cover with how CP looks like. Um, so it can either, the most common presentation is going to be spasticity. So that hypertonia rather than flaccidity or hypotonia. But really what it comes down to is you're going to see an abnormal muscle tone in the child. You're also going to see an abnormal reflex response. As I said before, since it's upper motor neuron, you're most likely going to see a hyper reflexive response rather than a hypo reflexive response, but it could happen with both. I know specifically with the hypo reflexia that can present in a child who has CP that is of the ataxic, um, like that's their subgroup that they've been uh, categorized into as ataxic cerebral palsy. Another thing you're going to see in this kind of goes into a lot of what we're going to see with our treatments is that they have impaired voluntary muscle control and mobility. So they can either only move their arms so much within a certain range, and they can only do so much. Like some of these children are fine. They're walking around. Everything's good. And then some of them need to be wheelchair bound or have other sort of um, 
assistive devices to help them get around in their daily life. So this is kind of where our OT friends come in to get all those fun toys that they're going to um, give these kids to help them get around and be a little bit more independent. So another way that this could present is it could involve one extremity. So it could just be your arm, could be both arms. It could be your left arm and your left leg, or it could be all of your legs. I mean, all of your, all of your extremities, all of your legs. Oh God. Um, and some other ways that it could present, I know I said earlier with the ataxia, that's if there's any loss of oxygen specifically to the cerebellum, because remember that's coordination of muscle movements and then athetosis. So that's the writhing, the sink like movements that is with the basal ganglia. So thinking about basal ganglia, that's going to show up again with Huntington's disease, all those issues with that and voluntary muscle control. So as I said before, the impairment could range from everything's okay over here. Just a, just a little issues here and there with like mobility and stuff like that, or they're completely wheelchair bound. So this is kind of a difficult one to think about, but the boards kind of has its own like little way that they like to think about um, cerebral palsy kids. So how are we treating it? As I said before, we're going to treat it based on the symptoms. We're not going to give somebody who can walk around perfectly fine a wheelchair. We're going to see what are their deficits and what can we do to make them the most independent as possible. So a lot of times we're going to have a multidisciplinary, all the time we're going to have a multidisciplinary approach to this. We're going to have some pharmaceuticals involved. Obviously we're not prescribing them, but uh, just be aware that one of your patients might be on one of these medications here. It could be on seizure medications because as we talked about, it is a brain disorder. They might have any sort of issues with seizures. So you just have to make sure those are taken care of. They're mostly probably going to be like a tonic clonic seizure or they could be a petite mal seizure. Those are the main common ones that you're going to see with them. So they're probably on some sort of medication to uh, control that, maybe like Topamax or something like that. They're going to be probably, if they're spastic on Botox or Baclofen to address any sort of spasticity. So then you can actually get some movement in that muscle and it's not just locked up. So then we're able to do something treatment wise. Um, as I said before, they might be having any sort of orthotics. So you might be working with um, another, uh, either an OT to be working with those orthotics. Maybe the PT is making them as well to help with joint positioning and then to also assist with any sort of ambulation. So if they have that like foot drop or something like that, they might have an AFO or something like that to help um, help them out help them out with ambulation and stuff like that. So as I said before, the assistive devices are gonna be customized for the patient's needs and whatever level of function that they're at to help them be the most independent. A lot of times, as I said, we're gonna be co-treating with OT and speech because, because of the um, muscular things going on in their mouth, they might have issues either swallowing or speaking in general. So speech is gonna be in there. And then OT is gonna be making all this cool stuff to help them be a little bit more independent and working on fine motor skills with them. So remember that when you're in a clinic, you might be co-treating with OT or speech for these kiddos. Um, now, PT-specific interventions, the most important thing, and I'm going to harp on this like 15 million times, is because these are most likely going to be kiddos, little youngins, and they're probably diagnosed when they're like a year old, if even they might even be before, might be at birth. The most important thing is caregiver education. So positioning, handling, making sure that if they need to be placed in a specific position to get a better stretch to help increase mobility while you're handling the kid, they might be hypotonic. So they're, they, their head might flop around a little bit. So you have to be a little bit more careful with handling. So that's the most important thing to make sure you're keeping the patient safe as they're going about their day. So that caregiver education on kind of what's going on with their kid and how we're best going to address these deficits to make sure they're as independent as possible. A lot of things that we can do on our side is lots of stretching, strengthening, and mobility stuff. So working on any sort of, you got to make it fun for the kiddos and stuff like that, making, doing some stretches with them, helping throw a ball and stuff like that, working on mobility, crawling, walking, playing a game, jumping around, all that stuff just to keep them progressing in the direction that we need them to go to be a little bit more independent. Again, splinting or assistive devices, teaching the patient and caregivers how to use them. If the kid's old enough to understand, so this is after they've gone through their in infancy and toddler st stages, they can use these assistive devices to help grab stuff. Let's say that they need a grabber or something like that. They can use their assistive device and we can teach them how to do that. 
Um, so splinting can be done either by the PT or the OT. That's to try to help get a little bit more um, mobility within the joints and stuff like that. Or maybe it's a protective splinting because maybe the joint's getting misaligned and it's becoming problematic. So as I said before, the most important thing is we're maximizing the patient's ability to function as independently as possible because these kiddos are going to grow up into being actual adults and <laughs> we're going to need to make sure that they can function as independently as possible in this non-accommodating world that we live in. So keywords I want you to think of when you're seeing this on the exam, hypoxia at childbirth or in infancy. That's kind of one of the big ones. You should start thinking, okay, this is probably going to present as CP. Spasticity and hyperreflexia. They could say maybe they have a kid who's walking on their toes or something like that because they have those really, really, really tight gastrocs. So we might be seeing that. So again, the spasticity and hyper are indicative of upper motor neuron uh, disorder, condition, all that stuff. So thinking about that. Delayed developmental milestones or failure to integrate the primitive reflexes. So maybe they're walking at like 15 months instead of 12 that we're seeing. Maybe that their uh, primitive reflexes aren't integrating when they're supposed to, like around four months, you're supposed to lose the palmer grasp reflex. Maybe at like eight months, they're still doing that automatically as you place the finger on the palmer side of their hand. Maybe they still have the ATNR, which where they're having issues, uh, donning, doffing clothing, stuff like that. That's kind of what they'll be talking about on the boards. And it's going to be a pediatric patient, as I said. Um, again, adult patients will come into your clinic with cerebral palsy, but hopefully by that point, they have learned all the things they need to learn to be functioning independently as possible. And you might see them for like an ortho-related condition. So sample question here today, guys. A physical therapist assistant treats a newborn recently diagnosed with moderate cerebral palsy. What is the most important intervention the physical therapist assistant should provide this patient? One, stretching to bilateral gastrocnemius. Two, taking measurements for a rear-facing wheelchair. Three, caregiver education on safe positioning and handling. Or four, progressive resistive exercises and weight bearing. So I'll give you guys about 15 seconds to answer this question. All right. So the answer is caregiver education on safe positioning and handling. So I definitely <laughs> drove this into the ground earlier. The most important thing is to make sure that the patient is safe and is being moved around and, and navigating their world in a way that's not going to cause any more issues or harm to the patient. So remember, the boards are asking you every time you look at a question, you should be thinking, what is the safest answer for this patient and the most effective treatment for this patient? So you gotta think safe and effective. Those are the two big things. So stretching bilateral gastroc, that's not a bad answer. Not a bad idea, probably needs it. They might be a little tight and spastic. Nothing wrong with that, but let's think about what the question's really asking. Number two, taking measurements for a real facing wheelchair. It's a newborn. They might need that later on, but it is way too soon to be thinking about any sort of uh, ambulatory devices because this baby can't even hold their head up. So that might be a future problem, but, and maybe a child with moderate cerebral palsy might need that, but as of right now, that's not what we're thinking about. We went over that three is the correct answer, being caregiver for education. Boom, right on the money. We really need to make sure that that kiddo is being safely handled by their parents and making sure that if they need stretched out in any sort of position, maybe they do need their gastroc stretched out, that we're teaching their parents how to appropriately do that. And progressive resistive exercises and weight bearing. Just make sure you're looking that it's a newborn, that they're not standing up at all. Um, and I don't think you're going to be able to get through many progressive resistive exercises with a newborn. But thanks for tuning in today, guys. I hope you guys found this very informative and helpful, and I'll see you guys in the next video.